We're at Twin Oaks in Highland Beach, Maryland. And this is the beach house that was built as the retirement home for Frederick Douglass. And he wanted to sit there and look back across the Chesapeake Bay. And on the other side, you can see the Eastern Shore. And that is where he was born a slave and where he toiled away in chains. And he was a person that, in spite of being born into slavery, he was somebody that always thought that history was important, that we needed to know where we've come from in order to know where we're headed. And unfortunately, he died before the house was completed, but this was the summer home of, of my family, and I spent many summers here as a boy. So this is a very special place for me. My great-grandmother met Frederick Douglass when she was a little girl. And she didn't know that she was going to grow up one day and marry his grandson, but that's exactly what happened. She lived to be 103 years old. And she would tell me firsthand stories about Frederick Douglass. And she used to call him the man with the great big white hair. And when I tell people I'm the great, great, great grandson, it sounds like I'm so far removed. But when you think about it, that hands that touch the great Frederick Douglass and hands that touch mine, with all those greats, I'm just one person away from history. My mother, Nettie uh, Washington Douglas, is the person that united the bloodlines of the Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington families. And the way that that happened was on my mom's side. My grandfather was Frederick Douglass III, and he was Frederick Douglass' great-grandson. And my grandmother, Nettie Hancock Washington, was Booker T. Washington's granddaughter. And the two of them met at Tuskegee in 1941. And Tuskegee is the university that Booker T. Washington founded. My grandparents were rushing across campus and they literally bumped into each other, didn't know that the other descended from an historic family and they fell in love at first sight and wound up getting married three months later. My grandfather, Frederick Douglass III, he was the namesake of one of this country's greatest heroes. And he had always walked around with this weight of expectation on his shoulders that he could be as great as Frederick Douglass. And when I came along and I had this dual lineage, my parents and my grandparents and great-grandparents went in the complete opposite direction and they weren't going to force anything on me. You know, I've always known about this great heritage and this great lineage and this blood that flows through my veins, but I've never celebrated it so I'm sometimes embarrassed to say that I grew up decisively disengaged from this lineage. A friend of mine handed me a National Geographic magazine, and the cover story was 21st Century Slaves. And I looked at that headline and reacted the way I think most people do the first time they hear about the existence of human trafficking and modern day slavery. And that slavery didn't end with the work of Frederick Douglass and the abolitionists, but it still exists all over the world, including here in the United States. And I remember reading the article and I was reading about a young girl who was a sex slave in, in the brothels of Southeast Asia. And she was forced to service 25, 30 men a day. And I have two teenage daughters who at the time were 12 and nine years old. And I remember reading the story and it was dark and I was in the living room of my house and, and down the hallway I could hear my girls laughing and my wife was telling them bedtime stories and getting them ready for bed and tucking them in. And I'm going back and forth from this story to what I'm hearing down the hall and I'm thinking, that's what young girls should be doing, is they should be being tucked safely into their beds. And I closed the article, and I walked in to say goodnight to them. And I realized that I couldn't look them in the eyes. I couldn't look them in the eyes and just walk away and not do anything about this. And it was at that moment that, that I realized that I had this platform that my ancestors had built through struggle and through sacrifice. And I knew that I could stand up on that platform and I could do something about this. I knew that there were people out there that would just want to hear from me about the legacies of these great men, of my great ancestors. But I could use that platform in a way to help people. Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington were visionaries and they were about helping people. It was a given that our organization would be about history and carrying on the legacies. But we needed to help people. And it, it just seemed very natural that 
If Frederick Douglass was the great abolitionist, his goal was to end slavery. Slavery still exists. And I have a feeling that he would expect his descendant to continue that fight for freedom. So we started the organization with that in mind as our premise that we would work to abolish modern day slavery. And then it was just a natural connection to bring in the education side, the Booker T. Washington side, and make that a part of how we were going to go about trying to affect change with this issue. I wanna to talk to you about Frederick Douglass. He was born Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, and he was born on the Eastern shore of Maryland to a black woman who was a slave and also to a white man who was, it was presumed was his slave master. And what I hope to do this morning is inspire you through their stories because we're gonna talk about two men that were born slaves. They were born into the most horrific conditions. The lives and the legacies of Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington are tangible examples for a young person to look at their lives and say, if they were able to overcome slavery and seemingly insurmountable obstacles to rise up to affect the lives of millions of people, then there's nothing that a young person cannot overcome in their own lives if they're looking at those examples as inspiration. We're introducing a service learning curriculum into New York City public schools called History, Human Rights, and the Power of One. So we talk about the history of slavery and the abolitionists, and then we transition into human rights and talking about this contemporary slavery. And then the Power of One is students working on service projects in their communities and all of those projects are around raising awareness about this issue so that the students can be the agents of change. They can go out and they would know how to recognize if their peers are in trouble and they would know how to go out and really kind of build this barrier of protection around the community. I think it was like a week after um, you guys came to our school and we did the presentation. I was at my aunt's laundry in Queens and I saw this this woman and this guy and she was like crying and her face was all red and she seemed like she was being afraid of that guy as if he had been mistreating her and she was just there standing with a phone and the guy yelling at her and then I try to think back of everything I learned and say maybe she's one of the victims I mean Knowing that it can be anyone that I know and haven't said something, it just made me feel like I wanted to do something about it. But since I didn't know much of what was actually going on, I couldn't just say, oh, hey, she's a victim of child trafficking. Yesterday in social studies class, Mr. Kurt showed us a video. And in the video, it was a mom and a daughter. And she dressed her daughter like a prostitute. Like she put lipstick on her, heels, and she sold her own daughter to a man. And I was, that really like touched my heart cause like for anything, if we think of child trafficking or whatever, um, we always think that is like victims, like they take them from their family, but to know that their own family, their own blood and flesh give them like a way like that is like, wow. Have you ever met a child who's like involved in human trafficking? How do they like just recover from something that like brutal, like being tortured and things like that? The victims that we have now, they have the knowledge to speak, but they are, they have to keep that. Um, they know what's happening, but they have to keep it inside of them. I understand the slaves uh, back in the days, they didn't have the knowledge to speak. Um, the power to speak, um, to report the people. But I understand now, like, how can you keep that stuff in your in your heart? Like, you, j you know what's happening, but you can't say anything. I put myself in the situation of that lady that was a guest speaker. She was a victim of human trafficking. And she said that she was alienated from her parents. And I couldn't imagine me not seeing my mom for like ever. That would hurt me a lot. And when I saw her there, like, oh my God, hold on. <laughs> when I saw her there, like, she was like, she was so brave that she had overcome all that trouble that she went through. 
and she was so strong and I saw in her that she she was like asking for us to do something and to help and be an abolitionist and that was what inspired me to be here today. Learning about it in school freshman year, I was really shocked to even hear like modern day slavery like it's still going on today. It didn't really even make sense to me because we've been taught that it's over and that that was something of the past. But seeing you come and sharing like your history and your heritage and being able to connect it, that was, it was a connection for me. I can see that we're not that far removed from slavery, like the, the slavery that we think that is, that was ended. You're standing here in front of me and you're, st you're a part of that family line. We're not that far away from it. The, the slavery is, is going on, but um, even though it's changed its shape, though it's not just the, the blacks and the whites, it's changed its shape, it's still slavery. And we can still be abolitionists today. Frederick Douglass said it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And when our young people can look at this issue and then we give them something to do in their community so that they can be modern day abolitionists, just like Frederick Douglass was an abolitionist, and students can communicate the inhumanity of slavery to their community, it uplifts them. In a way, I feel like I'm actually doing something for the world when, I'm, when, I, when you say that I'm an abolitionist, because usually when I see child trafficking or hear about it, I really just feel like I'm useless to people so when the idea of people just being used like that. A lot of times when you talk about like working with doing doing work for human trafficking and trying to like make it stop, a lot of times people are very discouraging and they tell you things like it's not gonna change and like they they're kinda again they feel like it you can't really make an impact. Anyone can sit around saying, oh human trafficking is not good, it's it should be illegal, people shouldn't be doing it. Yes, that's, that's nice that you're saying that, I agree with you, but what are you doing to stop it? Going, doing things like the um, radio interview, it made us feel like we are reaching other people and that we're not alone because we're gonna make them aware. And just by like having a conversation with people, if we give them the information, they can go and tell their friends, have it on their Facebook page, have it on Twitter, and the word spreads. But you have to like keep pushing. Don't just do it once and say, okay, I'm fine, I'm good. Did all I had to do for the day, I'm a good Samaritan, yeah. No, you have to keep doing it. This is actually what made me want to become an attorney in my career choice, because I want to make a difference. I want to make sure everybody knows that this isn't okay and it's still going on here. And I actually want to represent people that went through this to give them the fact that this is gonna stop one day and that it's okay that you went through this because after all there's an important message going out to other people that you could get through this. So this has really inspired me a lot. My main concern is helping to protect young people. That's the only thing that I care about right now. So I don't think about my future. You know, I'm in the middle of all of this work and I'm just focused on New York City and the work that we're going to be doing in schools there because I want to make sure that our students, our young people, our children are protected and educated and empowered. Some of us are the products of slavery. This country certainly is a product of slavery. This country is also the product of the abolition of slavery. And from Frederick Douglass, we learned that we have a right to be free. When I was growing up, the challenges faced by great men like Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington were apparent to me because it just so happens their blood runs through my veins. But the fact is, all of us, we live far from the cotton fields and we're worried more about our favorite sports team winning a playoff game than we are about the threat of being beaten by our overseers. The echoes of slavery are hard to hear from where we stand. But if we listen close enough, we'll hear cries and not echoes from the slaves of today. And we'll hear cries and not echoes from all of the young people out there that need hope 
and need inspiration and they need to hear these stories. And when we listen close enough, that's when change will happen. 